first day of shooting, I brought four of LA's greatest session players together. Carol Kay, Plaz Johnson, and Hal Blaine, along with my father. It was probably the first time that all four had been in the same room in about 20 years. You know, if all the guys that had been in the studios, God bless them all, for 20, 30 years, they all wore the blue blazers, the neckties, and there was no talking, no smoking, and no nothing. And we came in there with Levi's and T-shirts, smoking cigarettes, whatever. We're, yeah. And the older guys were saying, they're going to wreck the business. You know, they are going to yeah, wreck the music business. It didn't have the respect that the older guys had. Remember the older oh, studio oh, players, oh, Barney yeah. Kessels and... The Lloyd Elliott's, all these people. Yeah, well, exactly. that's how that whole Wrecking exactly. Crew thing came in. Even though the term The Wrecking Crew gained popularity with rock historians, many of these musicians never heard the term until years later. I think Hal Blaine is the first one I heard it from. Yeah. Uh, he uh, probably came up with the name. I think it kind of evolved, really. The there first was, time I heard the name, I think, was at the Baked Potato when they had that get-together. They used the expression The Wrecking Crew. Well, it was used before that. It was used while we were recording. And the definition of who was a member of the Wrecking Crew, there really isn't any definition. Between the engineers, producers, and musicians themselves, each has their own take on how this all went down. Together, they form a snapshot of a time that will never be repeated. Anybody could do five or six different things on as many different instruments also. There were a lot of producers at that time that were not really musicians, so these guys were able to decode Jordan. He's talking about me, by the way. Oh, no, I mean, there were some producers that really just, you know, didn't really know the musician's language, and these guys were able to just quickly interpret it. The people we're talking about played for so many people in so many different styles. That's a fascinating thing. They could walk into uh, a pop sound and play it. They could do rhythm and blues. They could do soul music. I guess they could have done classics if they'd had to but they had the magic touch. We injected a lot of ourselves into it because we were experts at doing it. We were doing it all the time. A guy would give us a lead sheet or something and we'd know what the song was. We made up a lot of arrangements and so forth on that set, ourselves on those things. Here's the way that the beat goes on, sound when we first heard it. la di da 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 yeah, I said, uh oh, we need to pull a rabbit out of a hat for this one. You know, it was our job to come up with riffs and stuff. So about the third line I came up with was da 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 you know. And Sonny loved it, and he gave it to Bob West, the bass player, to play it, and, and both of us are playing it throughout the tune. And without a good bass line, the tune doesn't pop, you know, it doesn't snap, you know, like a big hit record. The beat goes on. I've always said, they put notes on paper. The they put notes on paper. But that's not music. You make the music. It, what do you do with the notes? What right. do you do with the charts? What do you Absolutely. do with the chords? Well, other than that, they can yeah. call a union for a guitar. Sure, that, that's right. So, yeah. so it's what you put into it. Because uh, how many days, in and fact, we're all here. It's what you put into it that's not written. Yeah. Well, in fact, everybody that's sitting here, I remember doing different things that weren't ever even thought about, and then all of a sudden become part of the record and part of the We all used record. to produce our own parts. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. that simple. To make it 